All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining the Experience Electric Roadshow, the webinar edition. My name is Stefan Johnson, and I'm the Transportation Program Coordinator with CLEAR and a recharge coach for the Colorado Energy Office. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that EVs are not top of mind for most people at the moment. Um, despite all the difficulty and disruption and uncertainty happening in our country and around the world, uh, I hope that we can offer you a small consolation that now is still a great time to purchase an electric vehicle if you have the means and are looking for a new ride. So today we're going to have a presentation from special guest Craig Farnham. Say hello to everybody, Craig. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this morning. And uh, Craig's really gonna get at the, the heart of what it means to drive electric on the Western Slope. And uh, before that, I'm gonna be giving a quick update on several extremely exciting developments happening in our region, um, in the state of Colorado and around the world regarding the future of electric mobility. If you have any questions during the presentation, uh, we ask that you please enter them into the Q&A box and we'll be sure to get to them um, at the end of our slides. So before we really begin, uh, I wanna take a quick temperature of the room with a few quick polls. So uh, Maisa, if you would start the first poll and everyone should see them on their screen, if you would just take a few seconds to answer the first question. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, let's see. Most people learned about the uh, webinar via our newsletter. That is great to know. Misa, if you would uh, do the second poll question. Who thinks they're already an EV expert? Craig, all right, what, what's your answer for this question? Two. Two, ooh, that's, that's very modest. <laughs> okay, the results. Okay, yeah, we, we have a pretty even kind of bell distribution graph in there. Okay, great to see that. Thanks everyone for answering those quick polls for us really helpful to, to get feedback. Um, I'm gonna begin with a quick Recharge uh, background story. So Recharge Colorado works to accelerate EV adoption and charging infrastructure deployment across the state by offering individuals, schools, nonprofits, local governments, and businesses with technical expertise, coaching, and brand neutral unbiased advice. We had an early question whether um, either Craig or I worked for the automotive manufacturers and the, the answer to that is no, we are, uh, we are unbiased. So formerly known as Refuel Colorado, this program was initially piloted in Western Colorado by CLEAR, the Energy Office, and funding from the uh, Department of Energy all the way back in 2013. And the program's success led it to be expanded statewide. So there are currently five recharge organizations uh, spread across the state. And just to give an example of that success, in the past nine months alone, CLEAR has helped partner organizations on the Western Slope secure over $300,000 in competitive funding via the Charge Ahead grant program. And uh, shameless plug, there is currently a grant window open now until June 15th. So if you know of a location that could use EV charging, please, please get in touch with me as soon as possible. Next slide, please. I mainly want to take this time to highlight the amazing uh, electric vehicle sales that we have on offer. And uh, this event simply wouldn't be possible without the enthusiastic participation of our partner dealers and sponsors. So huge thanks to everyone up on the screen. We're really great for your, grateful for your support and uh, we could not do this without you. Next slide, please. So 2020 is the fourth year in a row that CLEAR has organized an electric vehicle sales event. And this was the first year that we expanded to partner with dealerships in Mesa County, in addition to uh, dealerships that we have previously worked with in the Glenwood Springs area of Garfield County. So this year in 2020, there are new offerings and new models that we're really excited about. 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, we had plans the, the sales event to launch on March 15th and run through June 15th. So it definitely was not the greatest time to launch an electric vehicle sales event, given everything that is happening in the world. Luckily, uh, most of our partner dealers have agreed to extend their offerings through at least the end of June uh, and, and hopefully longer. So we're working to finalize those extensions and stay tuned for those details to be announced very, very shortly. Disclaimer, we still have not uh, been able to finalize extensions with Audi Glenwood Springs or Grand West Kia. So if you have interest in an Audi e-tron or a Kia Nero plug-in hybrid vehicle, please reach out to those dealers as soon as possible uh, just to be on the safe side of things. And uh, if you go to the link displayed on the screen, garfieldcleanenergy.org slash dealer discounts, you can uh, find all of the details about what models and are available and what uh, discounts associated are available, as well as hyperlinks to those dealer pages so that you can uh, get in direct contact with, with those folks. Next slide, please. And uh, just to give a teaser of the, the finer details, we have a table here of all the participating dealerships and the, the models that are available along with the, the various discounts. Highlighted in yellow are uh, pure battery electric vehicles. Uh, these use absolutely zero fossil fuels and are 100% battery powered. And then uh, we have our hybrid vehicles that are not highlighted and use both battery technology as well as an internal combustion engine. So once again, uh, please go to garfieldcleanenergy.org slash EV2020 to uh, get the finer details and specifics about the, the models that are available. And if you do have any questions, uh, please, please reach out to me directly. And uh, we're really excited that uh, the electric vehicle sales event is still going on and it's possibly extended, but it's a good reminder that nothing lasts forever. And uh, that brings me to our next slide, please. <laughs> there has been a ton of uh, disruption and change happening rapidly in the world. And that is definitely uh, inclusive of the electric mobility space and mobility space in general. So. I think uh, a lot of people probably saw in the headlines uh, back in April that we actually had negative oil prices for the first time in history. And uh, this was due to a huge drop in demand for consumer travel because of the impact of COVID-19, combined with a game of chicken played by Russia and Saudi Arabia, um, which meant that oil futures actually traded at almost negative $40 per barrel back in April. Practically speaking, this means that we've seen a uh, very low gas prices at the pump. Uh, I think in the United States, the national average has been hovering around $2 per gallon for some time now. So naturally, this has led to some concern that EV sales will trend downward due to cheaper gas prices. And while this certainly will have some impact on uh, driver behavior and uh, you know, potential consumer demand, there's also some uh, other interesting forces at play that might counter um, this effect. So next slide, please. And one of those big counter forces is the clean air that we're seeing all around the world as a result of reduced transportation and industrial pollution um, happening because of COVID-19. And I think you know, for a lot of people are, are realizing what it would be like to live in a world where uh, electric vehicles were the norm rather than the exception. Uh, Currently on the screen, we have a picture from Jammu in northern India, where the Himalayas have not been seen in over three decades. So really, really um, amazing to see the drop in air pollution uh, due to decreased travel. Next slide, please. And uh, this, this drop in pollution was, you know, has been happening from Delhi to Denver. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of US 36 near Denver back in April, and I think underscores um, the, what, what, what the all-electric future promises in terms of improved air, air quality and reduced public health, health risks that, that are associated with uh, pollution from the internal combustion engine. Next slide, please. So in addition to 
the reduction in, uh, tra in uh, air pollution due to travel um, and the effects that that might have on consumer demand. Um, at least in Europe, we're seeing a surge in, in interest in, in electric vehicles due to this increased realization of the importance of clean air. We also have some really uh, interesting measures happening at the, the local policy level that should support uh, electric vehicle adoption. So uh, the state of Colorado released the uh, revised 2.0 version of the electric vehicle plan back in April. The initial version was released by the Hickenlooper administration back in 2018. And the plan calls for uh, 940,000 electric vehicles on Colorado roads by the year 2030. And for current context, there are under 29,000 electric vehicles in Colorado. So this really underscores the uh, hugely ambitious scale of this plan and all of the, the work that we really need to do to um, start to scale towards that number. Next slide, please. One of the uh, policy mechanisms that is gonna help get us to uh, greater EV adoption is uh, more infrastructure to combat uh, range anxiety, which is a frequently cited concern among consumers about why they might not want to purchase an electric vehicle. So uh, the state of Colorado signed an agreement with the uh, charging provider ChargePoint and uh, for a $10.3 million investment in high-speed charging all around the state. Um, in total, there's going to be 33 different locations that are going to um, be installing uh, high-speed fast charging uh, along six quarters throughout the state. Initially, these were supposed to come online by the end of June this month. However, due to the impacts of COVID-19, uh, those installation timelines have been pushed back slightly and disrupted. However, uh, we still expect to see these stations coming online in 2020. And looking at the map here, I think this really opens up a world of possibility for uh, making EV driving that much easier for uh, people that are considering an electric vehicle. And including here on the Western Slope, um, we, we're gonna see a lot of new infrastructure that's gonna make it a lot easier um, to, to get to places like Telluride, to get to Durango, and to get to Grand Junction and, and then connect back to the main I-70 corridor. So this is really, really exciting. And although the, the timeline has been slightly delayed, um, it's not, far, not too far into the future. Next slide, please. In addition to the uh, state government level, there's also incredible investment into the electric vehicle ecosystem that's going to be happening on the utility side of things. So on May 15th, um, XL Energy published their transportation electrification plan, or I should say filed their uh, transportation electrification plan with the Public Utilities Commission. And this uh, proposes $102 million to be invested in the EV ecosystem between 2021 and 2020. Three, and it's it's just really hard to overstate how big a deal this is. Um, this is really moving Colorado up to the top of the list in terms of hot electric vehicle states in the nation, uh, not too far on the tails of California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, just a few of the programs included in uh, Excel's proposal is a uh, investment in high speed charging for disadvantaged communities. Um, that's, we, we've seen that being a very tough barrier to adoption if you don't have electric vehicle charging in your neighborhood and if you live in an apartment or multi-unit dwelling and don't, aren't able to install your own home charger, um, that can be a really big barrier to electric vehicle adoption. So investing in these high-speed chargers in disadvantaged communities should really help to see uh, EV adoption across all income levels and all demographics. Additionally, there's uh, a proposal for a $2.2 million electric school bus pilot. It's very exciting, as well as a fleet advisory dashboard for businesses and local governments that are interested in electrifying their fleet and making sure that um, doing so would not impact their operations adversely. So um, over the, the course of the few months, there's going to be uh, hearings at the Public Utilities Commission uh, about Excel's transportation electrification plan. And uh, we're gonna seek to have that formalized and uh, approved so that Excel can 
um, actually implement these programs starting in 2021. And uh, this, is, this is going to be an uh, important place for um, everyone to um, you know, make your public comment heard if you want to see a future um, of electric transportation in Colorado grow. So uh, if you go, if you Google XL Transportation Electrification Plan, um, you, can, you can find the, the details. Um, it's a, it's a, it, it gets highly technical and highly detailed, but um, I think there's a lot of really exciting stuff in this plan. And um, all of the, the organizations and groups that are interested in, in electric mobility um, have been highly impressed by this and really want to push the PUC to, to adopt it and counter any uh, opposition that, that might come up from, from people that are not so enthusiastic about electric vehicle future. So there's, uh, you know, in sum, there's, there's rapid developments happening. Um, in the world of electric mobility, and there's a lot of exciting development that, that is shortly around the corner. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Craig. All right, thanks, Stefan. And um, while I start off this presentation, there's another Craig. There are actually two other Craigs in the audience. I mean, he asked a question about the, the bolt discount at Bozarth. Um, so maybe we can get to that. Uh, and that'll be one of our first questions at the end. Yeah, yeah, we'll definitely do that. Um, so I think, well, first of all, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we've done these before um, live and they've been a lot of fun. And as I go through this um, portion of the presentation, I think Stefan and I will kind of go back and forth a little bit. Um, little introduction, um, again, Craig Farnham, I'm a therapist in the Valley and um, so I'm not, um, I don't consider myself an, an EV expert. Um, that said, um, I'm pretty passionate about electric vehicles, mostly because of our own family experience. Um, really quickly, in a nutshell, uh, back in 2012, we needed a vehicle to um, scoot us around the valley and get to work and all that. Um, and we ran the numbers on what if, you know, what we would save on gas and maintenance if we had a, a Nissan Leaf. Um, and it really penciled out. And so we, but we weren't quite sure because we were like, why wouldn't everyone get an electric vehicle if the numbers actually penciled out like this? And so we decided to lease a Leaf and give it a try for two years. And um, over the course of those two years, we kind of um, kept track of the cost, the operating costs of the vehicle. Um, and we learned a lot. And, and one of the surprising things that we learned is um, we had a, a 2006 Toyota Tacoma at that time. And in addition to the savings that we used by using the Leaf, um, we ended up using the Leaf more than the Tacoma, which actually saved us money on um, depreciation and maintenance and gas for the Tacoma. So our Tacoma ended up lasting longer, keeping its value longer. Um, and you know, the tires lasted longer, oil changes were um, more infrequent, all of that. And so the math really um, was stunning to us. And that's when we started to save uh, for a Tesla, because we were like, all right, how can we do this on a larger scale um, when this lease is up? And um, so we ended up doing this crazy savings plan. We had a, a bulletin board in our living room and it was called the Tesla savings plan. And we kept all of our receipts and saved up for our down payment. Um, and we ended up selling our Tacoma um, and use that cash to finish our basement into an apartment. And so now we, we've rented out our basement and that has made our Tesla payments. Um, so anyways, that's a quick story. Um, if, if you wanted to find out more specifics on how we afforded the Tesla, you can, you can Google my name um, and it'll come up. Um, Post Independent actually did a, a story on it. So. Anyways, I don't consider myself an expert. And at the same time, we've had lots of experience. We've had um, that leased leaf. And then we actually got another leaf that we got for seven grand um, sitting on a lot um, in California uh, that had already used the California um, tax credit. And so nobody in California wanted it. And so we had it shipped over to here for, and ended up paying seven grand for that one. Um, anyways, driving an electric car since 2013 it's interesting that people have come up to us and told us why owning an electric vehicle doesn't work and will never work. 
And so I've always found that curious. And so that's why I'm naming this presentation, Top 10 Reasons Never to Get an Electric Vehicle. So these are things that other folks um, have told me of why it's not possible. Um, so before we kind of get into that, let's go to the next slide. As Stefan kind of mentioned, um, there are two, oh, we got a poll, that's right. Um, so let's do a quick poll, wake everyone up. Um, I think you should see a poll coming up asking, are you considering the purchase of an electric vehicle? Um, so if you can go Before ahead. Before you and... tell everyone on why not to get an electric vehicle, Craig, we have to, <laughs> okay. we have to, we have to get the, the first unbiased uh, answer to this question. Okay. Okay. So it looks like yes, but not right now is the overwhelming response, followed by actively looking, and then maybe 20% either already have one or unsure. Well, hope, hopefully by the end of the year presentation, everyone will have switched their answer to no. <laughs> I know, right? Okay. Um, essentially, when people talk about electric vehicles, they're talking about something that plugs in. Um, and there are two types of vehicles, generally speaking, that plug in. One is a purely battery powered vehicle that's the one on the right hand side of your screen is the we call it the bev battery electric vehicle there's no engines um there's no gas um and a plug-in vehicle um sort of has, has some sort of combination between um, a battery that runs that propels the vehicle and an engine um, and sometimes that engine serves as a generator to recharge that battery like it does in the vault um and sometimes it um you know the battery picks over, uh, sorry, the, the engine takes over propelling the car when the battery um, has lost its charge. Next slide. We're gonna talk about, so really quickly, some of the differences between those two types of vehicles. We have the battery electric vehicle on the left and a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle on the right. Um, so from a sort of parts standpoint, um, the purely um, electric battery only vehicle is simpler. Um, uh, I think a Tesla has a total of 48 moving parts, where in a traditional vehicle, it's like 4,800. Um, so we're talking about um, costly items that are moving and that need to be ultimately repl replaced. So timing belts, water pumps, radiators, um, coolant, fuel injectors, motor oil, transmission fluid, transmissions, um, exhaust systems. Um, both of these types of vehicles have regenerative braking. And what that means is that when you're coming up to a stop sign, or you're driving down Vail Pass, you can let off the accelerator and your car will slow down and it um, helps recharge the battery during that slowdown period. Um, so you see operating costs over 150,000 miles um, is definitely less for the, the battery, the full battery car. Next slide. All right, so here we go. Number one reason why people tell me they can't get an electric car is there's nowhere to charge. And, and we call that range anxiety. Um, and it's funny, I think the only people that really have range anxiety are the people who don't drive an electric vehicle. <laughs> um, once, once you have an electric vehicle, you kind of know like what your range is and, and what you do. Um, so, and then driving across the country or driving internationally, Relatively speaking, although there are gas stations everywhere, there's more electricity everywhere than gas stations. And so as we speak right now, I'm visiting family in Whitefish and our Tesla is plugged into what is called a level one charger. And that's the first charger there up on your screen. And this is a regular household socket. So I'm parked right outside their, their house, plugged into the wall. Um, and that's the, the slowest um, charging option for a car. Um, which is fine because I'm going to be here for a week. Um, and generally speaking, that if you plug a car, an electric vehicle into that outlet, it charges at about four miles per hour. And what that means is if you plug it in and you wait an hour, you'll have four additional miles of range. Down below is the level two charger. And this is the charger that's most common throughout the nation. And this is sort of where the industry came together and said, all right, we, need, we all need one plug. Um, and that's called the J1772. And um, that charges at a rate of about 20 to 25 miles per hour. Um, again, you plug it in for an hour, 
you go have a coffee or go for a walk, you come back, you'll have 25 more miles of range after that hour. And then we have the DC fast charging. There's generally two types of fast charging out there. There's the Tesla superchargers and then the um, fast charge, DC fast charging stations that are coming out that Stefan was talking about. So if we go to the next slide, there's an app called PlugShare. And everyone I know, including ourselves, who have an electric vehicle, use a PlugShare app when traveling outside of your normal driving radius. Um, so once you, I mean, if you live in the Round Fork Valley or if you live in Grand Junction or Breckenridge or wherever, you, you, you know where the chargers are and you generally don't need them if you're charging at home. Um, but when you're traveling outside of the normal range, just like a gas station, you kind of want to know, okay, where's the next gas station? Um, and PlugShare tells you where they are. And this is a free app um, and users actually can put their houses on there. We have our house on there. Um, so if you create a username and password, still free, um, you'll see um, people who have opened up their own houses, garages, or outside chargers to people who want a charger. So this is um, a screenshot of PlugShare, and it shows the free level two chargers in the region, in the Western Slope. When we first got our leaf in 2012, there was one in the valley in Carbondale. Um, and so driving to Silt or Rifle was, was always an adventure. Yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in here, Craig. I, yeah. So I became an electric vehicle driver in, in January, and uh, I, I, it's not a Tesla. Um, I have a Leaf, and uh, I, I have paid for charging uh, a few times when I've gone to uh, Denver and back. Uh, I've done that twice, and then um, I've also uh, charged up once in Grand Junction and paid for a fast charge there. But um, you know, I know I'm extremely lucky. But uh, I, I have paid practically nothing. I want to say you know somewhere between fifty and hundred dollars, and I've put uh, around four thousand miles on on my leaf since January. And um, I've just taken advantage of all of the free level two charging that's available in our region. I'm extremely fortunate to have. Uh, a charger at my workplace. But yeah, just looking at this map, there are tons of free level two chargers. So uh, it's, it's it really is kind of a spectacular um, value kind of to, to be able to take advantage of that. And the other thing to realize too, is it's sort of like gas stations. Like if one of those green spots were a gas station, there's more than one port. There's more than one gas station pump at each one. And so some of these um, locations have at, all of them have, well, I shouldn't say that. Most of them have at least two. Um, and many of them have many more than that. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Oops, I think we, there we go. So this is um, keeping the same chart. So same filter of where are all the level two chargers. And again, level two means charging at 20, about 25 miles of range per hour of charging. Um, and then the, the, um, the, the bronze colored ones are the fast chargers. Um, and Stefan, do you wanna jump in real quick about this plug yeah. share map? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's so funny. So Craig and I were doing a dry run of this presentation um, on Tuesday. And when he brought up this slide, I was like, Craig, when, when, when did you take a screenshot of this map? And he said, what did you say, Craig? It was, it was like the day before or something? Yeah, it was two days ago it's uh it's it's amazing how fast um we're adding high speed charging to our region and it's it's being added so quickly that some of those stations haven't even been added to the plug share app which is you know of course the, the market leader in infrastructure so just looking at it right now uh i know that we just had a new dc fast charger come online in carbondale there is definitely multiple level three dc fast chargers in the city of grand junction um and then you know in the in along the i-70 corridor near eagle and vale there is um multiple fast chargers there as well so i think it really kind of is testament to the the speed of development happening with eb charging and especially the fast charging along mm -hmm. corridors that are making it easier and easier to drive electric without having to be stuck at a, at a slow charger for for a long amount of time and really uh, growing that radius of, of where you can go. Yeah, and there's a new fast charger in Glenwood by the, the Lowe's too. Right, I forgot about that um, one. So there's, um, 
again, this is a social media platform. So if, if you're if if some of the respondents in our in our webinar today already have an electric vehicle, you can go on there and add that charger. Like do it yourself. If you say, hey, there's a charger here that's not even on PlugShare, go ahead and add it. Um, and if you're an EV owner, when you when you look up these locations, you can click on it on on PlugShare, learn how many ports it has, learn like where it is. People have usually posted pictures of the car charging so you can easily find it. Um, and you know, I I was trying to think when have I paid for charging? I think since 2013, I've paid for charging maybe once or twice. Um, generally speaking, it's free. And I think that the only time I really paid for charging was there was one time I think in Reno. And then there was a time where, when there were really not many chargers available back in 2015, we went to, um, we did a trip around Colorado or somewhere and we stayed at a campground um, and we plugged into the campground. Yeah. Well, that's because you have, you have access to the Tesla supercharger network, which we're about to get to, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, next slide. So these are um, only Tesla superchargers in the region. Um, generally speaking, when you look at a map of the US and you go from east to west, there's um, basically a supercharger within 100 to 150 miles along the main routes from east to west. Um, whether they're free or not depends on when you bought or when somebody buys their car. And so Tesla sometimes goes through periods of like, all right, if you buy a car now, you don't have to pay for supercharging. And, and that follows the car. So for example, we have free supercharging. If we sold our car to somebody, then they would also have free supercharging. Um, you could also get, I think you can get free supercharging if you get a, a referral um, from somebody who has, who owns a Tesla. Um, all right, we'll keep going. I would wait, let's stay, go back to that slide if you yeah. would mind. So, so I think I want to, I want to talk about the, the, the kind of why, why is the, why is this infrastructure for, for, for mm. proprietary, excuse me. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, as a Nissan Leaf driver, I am incredibly envious of you as a Tesla driver having access to this infrastructure. Um, but, you know, I think Elon Musk in all of his uh, glorious uh, Twitter, Twitter feed and uh, stunts that he pulls, you know, he's very transparent about the fact that he will eventually open up this network um, if it, if it makes business sense. And uh, once we kind of reach that level of adoption where, um, you know, the, the return and revenue by offering up this service to other people makes sense. And it's also, you know, it's a benefit to his consumers for choosing to go electric. Um, to this date, you know, none of the other automotive companies in the world have invested anywhere close into this level of infrastructure, but we're starting to finally see it in Europe um, the groups, uh, BMW, Audi, um, uh, Volkswagen, they're already, they're all starting to really partner together and build out their own networks of high speed charging. And so I think we're going to see that start happening in the United States pretty soon. And then, you know, as, as we get more and more high speed charging, I think, you know, it'll become more and more of a competitive kind of business opportunity. And we'll see more of this infrastructure be opened up to all of the, the new electric vehicles that are coming onto the market. Yeah, and Stefan, really quickly too, um, people sometimes ask, well, why is Tesla only for Tesla chargers? And when Tesla's first came out, there was only one vehicle that could take energy that quickly, and that was a Tesla. And that's almost still the case with a few exceptions. Exactly. And so that's why they started off like that. We got a couple of questions. Um, one is when I say free level two charging, and the question is, is it free to use but pay for electricity or is it free electricity? And the answer is most of the time, like all in our valley, level two chargers are free. Um, you're, they're, our tax dollars essentially have paid for them um, to be installed. So you pull up to the CMC campus in Carbondale and you plug in and it doesn't cost anything. Um, an interesting side note, there are some communities that are like, why are we paying for other people's electricity? Why should, why should we do that? And um, I happened to go through um, Steamboat Springs when they first installed their charger. And I wrote a letter to the editor um, because I had heard some of that up there. 
And it's interesting because if you're charging for an hour or two, you don't, it's not like a gas station where you, you plug in and you stand there and you watch your car charge for a couple hours. Um, you go as, you know, as soon as I walk away from that charger and go buy a coffee, the taxpayers have already made a profit Yeah, because it, it costs, you know, so little in terms of electricity to charge a vehicle. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've worked with a lot of partners on the charger head grants and a lot of them are, are interested in the economic development um, benefits that adding EV charging to their town or business will bring. And um, that brings us to another one of the questions we've received from, from Craig, um, the other Craig in the Q&A. Any plans for chargers in Delta and on the Grand Mesa? I'm glad you asked that, Craig. Um, back in uh, late 2019, I worked with uh, two partners, one in Cedar Ridge and one being the U.S. Forest Service to apply for uh, funding. And there is going to be uh, two level two chargers that are going to be added to the Grand Mesa Scenic Byway. One at the U.S. Uh, the, the Forest Service's Visitor Center and uh, one in the town of Cedar Ridge. And so those stations should be coming online quite shortly. And that's a good reminder for me to check in on the status of those projects. Great. And you know, it's funny when you talked about um, chargers being added all the time, when we, we once went to, took the, our car to Salt Lake City to see a friend and on the, on the way back to Carbondale, there was a charger that didn't exist. That was from when we got to Salt Lake City. So there was literally a new supercharger that was installed that we were able to use um, on the way back to Carbondale. So they're going up all the time. Yeah, that's wild. Go right, next slide, please. Um, you know, and I think, so remember how we talked about, um, at a gas station, there's, there's multiple pumps and at a charging station, there are multiple ports. So if you just count the ports, um, there are about 14, so 14 cars could charge at the same time in Carbondale, 19 cars in Glenwood and about 15 in Basalt. Um, but really the biggest advantage is, um, home charging. If you, um, have a place where you can plug in at home then essentially it's like having a gas station at your house. And when I do this presentation live, I say, how many people every morning, the first thing they do is they go to the gas station and fill up their car and nobody raises their hand. <laughs> when you have an electric vehicle, you typically, um, or me or my friends, we typically leave the house with a full tank with a full charge. And so range anxiety disappears because you never have to look at your, how much, how many more miles you have. Um, unlike a gas car where you have to, you know, if you don't fill it every morning, you have to kind of say, oh, whoops, I, I got to go visit a gas station. Um, with an electric vehicle, you're, you're full every day. So range anxiety really doesn't exist um, when you're, you know, doing your normal commuting. Um, but the beauty of that is, is, is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've seen the, the statistics uh, nationally. The average uh, daily uh, miles driven is somewhere around 40. And so, you know, even though we, we live in Western Colorado and sometimes people have longer commute distances, um, I think that that uh, trend generally holds true. And so, you know, with pretty much any electric uh, vehicle model, uh, even the first generation ones, which, um, you know, the, new, the newest EV models that are coming out are vastly improved in, in battery technology and the range that they offer. Um, if you have access to home charging, you you're always going to be, you know, fully, you're going to, you're going to have plenty of plenty of charge to get wherever you need to go on your, your, your daily uh, commute and uh, errands. So that's the long response to the top reason of there's nowhere to charge. Let's go to the, let's go to the next slide. Uh, number two, nobody wants one. Um, well, that's not entirely true. Um, there are, um, you can see some of the annual EV sales. And if you can click forward again on that slide, that'd be great. Um, so those are some of the annual sales. And here's what's selling. Um, 2018 has been the biggest year for EV sales so far. It was bigger than 2019, um, mostly because the model Tesla Model 3 came out in that year. And you'll see how many were sold. Um, and the 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 rebates the um, federal rebate was still uh, in full effect um, at the beginning of 2018. Do you want to add anything, Stefan? 
Yeah, I, I, I think um, you, you gave a good explanation for why we saw 2019 sales dip a little bit. Um, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but uh, a lot of the forecasters and market analysts are predicting that uh, electric vehicles are, are cor of course going to be way down in 2020. Um, Wood McKenzie predicts that they will be down 43% globally, but that is actually um, less of a decline than the uh, auto market as a whole for some of the reasons that we talked about in terms of people seeing the benefits of air quality awareness. Um, and and uh, so it's, it's going to be a tough year for all auto sales and it's going to be a tough uh, year for, for EV sales, but uh, everyone also anticipates those to uh, come, come roaring back. And what's really exciting is we're, we're not far away from a bunch of new um, electric vehicle models that are going to be coming online to just um, really increase consumer choice. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think, I think this is a good time to buy an electric vehicle. It's kind of like buying Halloween candy after Halloween has passed. Um, it's because it, if it isn't on people's minds and they're not selling well, I think car dealerships are more open to discounts. You'll probably get a better deal on them. Um, there's, a, there's a question here. Once your car is fully charged during the nighttime when it's plugged in at home, does it stop using electricity? Um, so yes, it does. As soon as um, a car is fully charged, it'll, um, it, it knows when it's done and it'll stop using electricity. The other thing too is that on many models, you can set how much electricity you want to use. So for example, for our car, we have a, we have a 2016 Model S and we usually set our charge to maybe halfway or three quarters. And so as soon as it, it hits three quarters or halfway, it's done. It stops using electricity and we start off our morning um, with even a half charge is, you know, 160 something miles that we won't use. Um, so I think that I hope that answered that question. Yeah. yeah. Then related to the to the vehicle um, page that we have up, uh, Craig asks, why is the uh, Bolt discounted over eleven thousand um, dollars? And this kind of speaks to what what Craig has up on the screen. So we have two participating Chevrolet dealerships, one in Grand Junction, one in Glenwood Springs, and both of them are offering a huge um, eleven thousand two hundred dollar discount on their twenty twenty Bolt models. And part of the reason why um, the, the discounts are so generous on the Bolt is because General Motors, along with Tesla, are the first two car manufacturers in the United States to hit the cap on um, their federal tax credits. So um, a manufacturer was allowed to get a full $7,500 tax credit um, on, on each vehicle up to 200,000 vehicles sold. And General Motors and Tesla uh, recently passed those thresholds. So the, the discount, um, the federal tax incentive went away and General Motors um, is sort of uh, eating those costs and making sure that their, their model still remains very price attractive for all consumers. Um, additionally, related uh, question from Diego Lopez, why was the Chevrolet Volt discontinued? Um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you would, the, there, there's definitely been kind of articles written about why they moved away from that. And, uh, mostly it's because they're, they're actually, um, looking at full electrification of their platform. Uh, they've had a lot of success with the bolts and they believe that for the most part, um, the, the future is all electric. And so they're really focusing their, their kind of resources into the all electric, all battery platform. You know, it's interesting. The Volt was is such a is a great car, and it's a great car for somebody who's who wants some of the advantages of electric, um, and also wants sort of that that insurance of having that a gas backup engine. It really is. It was a fun car to drive, uh, front wheel drive, so it's good in the snow. Um, so picking up a used Volt, um, can, you can find one at a pretty great price. Let's go to the next slide. All right. So number three. Oh, EVs aren't any better for the environment than a gas car. Um, there's lots of research um, out there. And when you look at the research from um, folks who are not sponsored by, by any, any you know, um, specific industry, um, it's all very clear that even from, from production 
to the life cycle, end of life cycle for the vehicle, um, that emissions are lower. Um, even if you're on a dirtier grid um, in the United States, or if your state you know, has, has a lot of coal powered electricity, um, no matter the grid um, and no matter how good the hybrid is, um, a fully electric vehicle um, emits less um, over the life cycle of the car. Go to the next slide, please. Um, this is what I'm, I've been getting recently. Like you're just replacing drilling for oil and drill it with drilling for lithium. And there's this interesting photo online. If you look up drilling for, I think they took it down, but if you look up drilling for lithium, they used to, it used to show this huge pit in the side of this mountain that was drilling for lithium. And it wasn't, it was, it was mining for something else and it wasn't lithium. Um, and of course, all mining has environmental consequences. And there are some important differences to keep in mind when we're talking about, you know, build, using, you know, mining for, for metals to build batteries versus mining to, to, to drill oil. And so here's some of those. Um, basically, every time that we use um, a gas vehicle, it takes more drilling to refuel that vehicle. You, you know, that once that, that fuel is burned, it goes away and we need more fuel from the ground. Um, EV batteries, um, they mine the metals once. And so it goes into your vehicle once. Um, and then that battery gets either repurposed or recycled um, <clears throat> into another car. Um, almost all of the lithium um, is produced through a process of pumping um, underground, underground brine to the surface. And so what that means is, if you go to the next slide, please, what that means is when we talk about mining for um, cobalt or uh, lithium or nickel, um, there's, there's nothing you would think of as, um, as mining. So there's no blasting, there's no trucks driving around, driving down your streets, there's no um, sulfuric acid spraying. And the primary sources of lithium are not in people's backyards. They're in areas of the planet where there's basically no life. Um, and that last stat there talks about these locations and they compared it to areas on Mars where there's very little, if not any life at all. I'm, I'm gonna jump in here real quick, Craig. So mm -hmm. I was actually listening to a, a fascinating podcast this morning. And uh, so a, as, you, as you point out right now, most of the, the current lithium mining developments are in, uh, in South America and Chile and Argentina and Bolivia as well, um, the other big production or development mining site is in Australia. And so, you know, especially um, we're, we're seeing concerns about uh, global supply chains and, and the, the potential vulnerabilities they have um, in, in the aftermath of COVID-19. And uh, there, there actually is some lithium a little bit closer to our backyard. So there are some really um, exciting technologies being developed to con develop uh, unconventional lithium um, mining production in the United States and North America actually has some some reserves that could potentially be tapped um, in in the coming years and really shorten the supply chain and uh, increase U.S. manufacturing and battery production and uh, it's it's also a reason for concern because uh, you know there is impact that happens with mining but you know like with uh, the the case of of South America uh, most of these deposits are going to be in areas that are um, pretty lacking in, in uh, ecosystem habitat and are pretty dead. So the Salton Sea in California is kind of um, considered one of the new, the new lithium um, hotspots that could potentially be developed over the course of the next decade as uh, these new unconventional lithium mining techniques improve. Um, so that's a space to watch with great interest. And as the technology of batteries increases, what we're finding is that batteries are getting less and less expensive. And part of why they're getting less expensive is because they're using less and less um, of the actual metals in each battery. So let's go to the next slide, please. Number five, EVs will never work. It's a political scam. <laughs> um, quick little story here. Um, my my father-in-law, love him. He's an amazing guy. And um, we come from kind of two different political ends of the spectrum. Um, which is great, it is fine. Um, he's, he's really conservative and he came out when we had our, our baby, they came out to live with us for um, a few months and we handed him the keys to the Lisa Leaf and says, here, you can take this um, and the whole time you're here. 
And so he kind of snickered, took the keys and he drove it every day and he, was, he would come back with a different comment and he's like, oh, this thing's pretty fast and all that. And so time came up and he went back to, to, to Charleston and he bought a leaf. And in his, when he went to um, hang out with friends or to social gatherings, his conservative buddies would joke with him and they say, oh, you're turning into a tree hugger, all that. And he's, he was just like, no, I'm cheap. <laughs> and he, he just, he's like, I don't want to spend money on gas. I don't want to spend money on maintenance. Um, and so it's, 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 it's not necessarily a political scam. Um, number six. It's just cheaper to get a Camry. And as electric cars get cheaper, um, the, the numbers and the math continues to work out um, even more and more. Um, you'll see this is, an, and it's interesting, if you stop calculating the price between a, an electric car and a regular car, if you stop your calculation at the purchase price, oftentimes it will be more expensive. But again, the math that we found worked for us with the Leaf and the Tesla is when you factor in all of these things. When you factor in um, that Tesla has great resale, you know, one of the best in the industry. Um, so, um, you know, when you factor all this in, and the bottom here is sort of the, the cost per mile after five years of ownership. And that Model 3 is less than the Toyota Camry. And for us, what we found is that unlike a traditional car, like after five years, that, that electric vehicle, you know, it, it's still gonna require less maintenance. So we have about 75,000 miles, I think, on our Tesla, and we've replaced a windshield, tires, and windshield wipers. Um, and so once it's paid off, it continues to, to have a really low operating cost. Whereas a traditional car, you've got a timing belt at 100,000 miles, you've got brake jobs, you've got exhaust systems, you've got all these other things. Um, an electric vehicle brakes often last like 200,000 miles because of that regenerative braking. So, um, you know, we don't, you can take like, you know, car mechanics, like we just don't have anything to do with them. We, you know, we don't have anything to do with gas stations, like all those things just, just kind of go away and you don't need to spend money on things that um, we used to spend money on. Stefan, do you have anything to add to this? No, I, I would just say that, you know, it's when I, when I saw this slide for the first time, you know, it, it, my jaw dropped. And so I would say, you know, there's people that might be skeptical. Please follow up with Craig and I, and we can really mm -hmm. show break out the spreadsheets and show you how you really <clears throat> get amazing savings that come, come with an electric vehicle. Um, Terrific. Let's go to the number seven or the next slide. Um, somebody in the audience asked for sort of a, a breakdown of the base price and the, and the range. And that's why I put this slide in here. And it kind of tells you like, what can you get for your money? Um, it's interesting, some of these cars are only sold in California as a compliance vehicle. So like that Fiat 500, I think you can only get that in California in the Mini Cooper. Um, but you can see, it used to be like you had to spend, you know, 90,000 as a sticker price to get a range of 250. Um, and now that's certainly not the case. Um, so anyways, if, if you're interested in like what's out there, I think this chart is, can be really helpful. And, and real quick, uh, I would just add to that, you know, it's uh, this is a, this is not an exhaustive list and soon it's going to be pretty, uh, um, it's going to be pretty inaccurate in terms of encompassing all of the electric vehicles on the market because in the next, um, two, two, two to five years, we're just going to see so many new models flooding the market, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. Stefan, have you put your money down on a Rivian or a Cybertruck yet? <laughs> no, no, I have not. I'm, I'm sticking to my leaf for now, but, uh, I will, I'll be saving the money, the money in my, my piggy bank for the, for the Rivian truck. All right, cool. Let's go to the next slide. Number seven, you can't drive an AV in the mountains in the snow. Everyone in Colorado needs a Subaru. Um, well, that hasn't been our experience. We, when we had our Leaf, we would drive from our house in Carbondale to um, Sunlight Mountain in Glenwood um, once a week at night in snowstorms. Um, we would fat bike up, up the mountain. Um, 
and it did great. It did great in the snow. We find that the the, the weight distribution in an electric vehicle is different than a regular vehicle. Um, and so that's evenly distributed so that all the weight um, is evenly distributed on the tires, which get more traction. Um, so that improves handling when it's dry and um, handling when it's when it's wet. Um, it's interesting that our Tesla with snow tires actually does better in the snow than our Tacoma did um, wow. with the downside of clearance. We got our, our car without the suspension package. So it, I think clearance is the biggest thing, um, but otherwise it does amazing in the snow. Leadville, we do lots of driving all year round. Yeah, I can attest to that with my, with my leaf going up steep icy roads this winter as well. We'll go to the next slide, please. Um, some other random thoughts my wife and I had one night um, while owning a, uh, an EV. Um, if you get mad at someone at the stoplight, you can't show your aggression by through your vehicle noise. You can't rev your engine. It's quiet. There's no sound. You can still squeal your tires. <laughs> but, um, owning an EV reduces suicide rate to CO2 poisoning to zero. Um, and Owning an EV is interesting because you'll watch pedestrians who need to relearn that before they cross the street, they need to watch and look both ways. Um, so many people, in, you know, we, we learn to just listen to cars. And so we can be pulling through a Costco parking lot and have to drive really slow because people don't look both ways. They just walk right out in front of us. Um, but most, most new EVs come with a, some sort of buzzer or a noise, a hum that makes, makes a hum below like I think 15 miles an hour so that pedestrians um, can hear it. Um, and then finally, I think EVs make better bug out vehicles um, than traditional um, internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, Cause you can always get solar power electricity. 100%. So some random thoughts. Yes. Great way to, to conclude um, our presentation. So we're just one minute over the hour. Um, I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their day to, uh, to join us and uh, we'll, we'll stay online in case anyone has a few extra questions, but um, otherwise when, when we end this, there will be a survey that will pop up. If you uh, would please fill that out, we would hugely appreciate it. And uh, if you have any questions about our presentations or the, the sales that are available or EV charging stations that are um, uh, slated to be added to the Western Slope please reach out to us.